Chapter Twelve: New York Wins Staten Island. Since the days of Kieft, when Indians thirsting for revenge began to choose its lonely farms and woodlands for their most frequent attacks, Staten Island had led a rather dramatic existence. Now, under the Duke of York, the whole question of its relationship to neighboring territory for centuries to come was settled by the adventure of a single day. Both New Jersey and New York wanted Staten Island. There had been much dispute about the boundaries, and it was agreed that New York should have all the islands in the harbor that could be circumnavigated in twenty-four hours. Staten Island, separated from New Jersey by only the narrow Kilvancol and Arthur Kill, might never have joined Greater New York as the borough of Richmond had it not been for skillful Captain Charles Billop and his sloop the Bentley. Sailing around Staten Island in twenty-four hours seemed one of those things that couldn't be done, but doing the impossible is the test of a New Yorker. Accordingly, Captain Billop. Tacked and veered, the little Bentley strained at its canvas, and between them, Richmond Borough was saved for Greater New York. The captain was rewarded by a vast manor grant at Tottenville, to which he gave the name of Bentley in commemoration of his sloop. Governor Lovelace made the last and sixth purchase of Staten Island from the Indians, and in his time, the island's real progress began. Surveyors were sent over, and by 1700, at least 200 families had settled there. Other parts of the province forged ahead as well. A ferry was established to the Bronx at about 125th Street, and from Lower Manhattan Island, a narrow wagon trail was laid to the village of Harlem, encouraging little taverns to spring up along its route. On the present site of Garden City, a racecourse was built. Called the New Market, which became a sporting center for all the colonies. Before long, the bustling merchant ships from overseas brought word that England, Sweden, and Holland had formed the Triple Alliance, and this fact served to bind New York's inhabitants into closer friendship with each other. A club of prominent families began to meet twice a week in each other's homes, and to hold a series of formal affairs that set the aristocratic tone of New York society for generations. There was a beginning of cooperation among the merchants as well. For early in 1670, Governor Lovelace opened a merchants' exchange. This first curb market met each Friday morning at a bridge over the Hierogracht or Gentlemen's Canal. Which still flowed down our present-day Broad Street, much to the disgust we may imagine of the small boys who were forbidden to use their sleds on that especially fine steep hill leading to the bridge. Then, once again, England and Holland went to war, and the threat of Dutch recapture stirred little New York to a high pitch of excitement. Governor Lovelace felt that he and Governor Winthrop of Massachusetts should keep each other informed of events in such a time of peril, and consequently the first postal service between the colonies grew out of the moment's need. It was not elaborate. John Archer set out for Boston by horseback with his packet of letters. He marked his route carefully on the trees, and in due time returned with Governor Winthrop's neatly inscribed answers. However, in spite of all his efforts to keep on the alert, Lovelace was finally caught napping. When the Dutch fleet sailed up the bay on August ninth, sixteen seventy-three, the governor was visiting in New Rochelle, and Captain Manning, who was in charge of the fort, could do nothing in its defense. His guns had been spiked by Dutch sympathizers, and after an hour of bombarding on the part of Admiral Evertsen, commanding the Dutch attack. Manning surrendered as Stuyvesant had done, without firing a shot. For this act, his sword was later broken over his head. He retired in disgrace to his estate on Hog Island, which, upon his death, took its name from his son-in-law Robert Blackwell. Today, a place of gloomy prisons, it is officially known as Welfare Island. In the meanwhile, New York had become New Orange under the brief return rule of the Dutch. Anthony Colvay served as its governor, and in the confused state of affairs, had a little time to prove whether he might be a good one or not. As it was, the townspeople probably remembered his elegant coach and four much longer than their owner.
Admiral Everton's conquest of New York had come a month too late for Holland, as news traveled across the ocean in those days. Peace was actually being declared in The Hague at the moment Captain Manning was surrendering the fort. Holland agreed to give up all captured territory, little dreaming that she was abandoning her only foothold in North America. Thus the pact was already sealed when word came that New York had been taken, all too late. New Orange was once more handed back to the Duke of York, who was not enthusiastic about receiving it. To him, it had meant a great deal of trouble and disappointingly little revenue. He must have sighed as he appointed Edmund Andros as its new governor.